There we go. Okay, so welcome to our newest workshop for the Grassroots Growth, growth Initiative um, with the Dunchurch Agricultural Society. And it's funded by the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, the topic this time is harvest time. So we're starting with just a little slideshow. And um, this is a Q&A, so feel free to like interject with your questions or comments. We'd like to hear them. Uh, so the first part of this slideshow is um, Juliet's garden. So here we go. So Juliet, is it okay if you take over from here while we go through these slides for you? Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to read what is written? Definitely. Many of us. Okay. <laughs> Many of us do recognize herbs and veggies as they appear in the store, clean, ripe, and ready to use, fresh or cooked for our meals. Next slide. Ooh, too many slides. <laughs> <laughs> that was all right. Here we go. Okay. So ripening in the garden. Good news for gardeners. Uh, the fruit of our labor ripens in stages, thank goodness, for weeks of enjoyment and processing. Um, what you're looking at here is a variety of beefsteak tomatoes starting to ripen on the vine. I also have, I don't know if you can see them in there, some black cherry tomatoes. They're on the same uh, patch. And um, down the road, I have some um, sauce tomatoes. They're different. They have more meat and less juice. So next slide. onto corn on the stalk and also on the cob. And I like to grow Navajo corn because it seems really well suited to this area and the temperatures that it gives. And I actually won first prize at the fair on my Navajo corn because our judge said it was completely ripe right around to the tip. So if you take a look at that corn stalk there, you can see how the kernels are ripe right up around to the point and over. So that's a prize winner right there. Next slide. Mm. I also grew kohlrabi. My neighbor struggles with it, but I understand why you can plant 10 seeds and maybe three or four will actually um, blush out with this lovely, uh, I guess it tastes like cabbage to me, but this lovely uh, growth in the stem. As you can see in the middle there, there's a few in behind that are just stalks. They have never blushed out into this nice fruit or veggie. I guess there's no seeds, it's a veggie. Um, but they're there providing shade for these others. So I left them for a bit. Next slide. Oh, I have a question already. Oh, yes. What do you do with your kohlrabi? Because we were given quite oh, a bit yum, of it yum. and I don't know what to do with it. I love kohlrabi. And I'm just learning as I go. So you Google, Google, Google. But um, I take it and chop it up like it's a turnip, but it tastes like cabbage and it cooks up soft like a cabbage. So I um, slice it and pan fry it with my eggs in the morning for breakfast. I've also just chopped it up and put it in a great big pot of soup for this afternoon. And it would go just as well in, in any stew or um, even a casserole, I expect. It's a very mild flavor. And if you have spices in there, it would absorb that nicely. So my kohlrabi in the chicken soup tastes like chicken soup and cabbage. <laughs> hmm, thank you. <laughs> Can I add something there too, Eva and Julie? Um, we have often eaten it raw with a dip, just like you would carrots or celery. Really? Cut it into sticks or whatever. Nice. Hmm. Yes, it's very mild flavored. It would do that nicely. Thanks, Jane. Welcome. The more <laughs> you know. Yeah. So here are my peppers and they're starting to turn red. I have new ace and carmen red peppers. The new ace is more like a bell pepper, um, which is, well, you know, bell peppers out of the store. And the carmen is more of a longer pepper not quite like a banana pepper, but halfway in between. So um, I've, I've got a plethora of peppers in the <laughs> garden. 
And I have a question about those peppers, Juliet. Yes. Do you have to wait until they turn color or can you pick them and eat them when they're green? I can never wait. So <laughs> if they start uh, blushing, I'll bring three or four in and set them in the windowsill. And we'll have one that looks like Christmas for breakfast, which is both red and green. And by the time I get to the third, it's a red pepper. Okay. So that's it. And with my peppers, to save them over if I have five or six and I don't know what to do with them, I can either slice them or chop them up into bits. And I'll lay them out on a cookie sheet and get them partway frozen. And then I'll put them in a freezer bag and label when I put them in the freezer. And they're ready to go for anything. Um, egg what would you call it? Stir fry. The Western sandwiches or omelets or stews or soups or anything. They're just ready to go. So okay. thank that's you. easy peasy. And this is a purple cabbage. I was gifted by a neighbor with a few babies and I got three out of the pack, which is great. And it's sitting in there nestled in with my, my bronze fennel. I don't know if those yellow flowers or bronze fennel is getting ready to go to seed. And I just love the smell of that because it's kind of licorice smelling in the garden. So if you disturb it at all, like I check out the cabbage and I disturb it and it just has this beautiful fragrance for me while I'm there. And it helps ward off bugs too. So I'm just thrilled about that. Next slide. Yeah, the cabbage at the, I think there's a cabbage at the library that got eaten by bugs every time it produced any new leaf. <laughs> it was immediately uh, eaten. Poor thing. Well, here's my carrots. So I did carrots. <laughs> um, and I grew three kinds this year, regular Nantes, which is a traditional orange carrot. And then I had red sunset, which is what we're looking at here. And I also have yellow carrots in the garden, but you have to be careful with them. If they are five minutes in the sun, they turn green instantly. So I don't know what you do with a green carrot. Can you even eat it? I don't know. But uh, here's my red carrots. Next okay. slide. So my rainbow of flavor, I was going with the theme here. I have yellow beets, red carrots, and red beets. Um, Jean, did you want to give us a secret or two about what you do with carrots? Sure. Um, when we dig the carrots, we let them, usually dig them, leave them in the garden for a bit, and then we wash them. We cut about, uh, cut the top off, leaving about three quarters of an inch and making sure they're dry, I then pack them in the vegetable bags, vegetable Ziploc bags that you can get at the grocery store, dollar store, wherever. And they've got little perforations in them so that they allow a little bit of, of um, air through. <clears throat> and we store them from there. We uh, store them in a spare refrigerator that we have in the basement. Um, that's the only way we've been able to keep them. If we put them in our cold room, it doesn't have the right humidity for carrots and they either rot or they just whistle up. So I found that putting them in those plastic bags keeps them really well, but they have to be mature. Um, we have a question from Mary. What is the difference in flavor between the two different kinds of beets? Okay, that's a great question, Mary, and thanks for that. Um, I personally have a digestive problem with red beets. They're a bit strong for my stomach and um, cook them, pickle them. It doesn't seem to matter. I can't eat too many. I'll get a bellyache. But with the, the yellow beets, they're gentler. They're a milder flavor. So if you take all, if you can appreciate all the sweetness of a red beet, that's all there in the yellow beet. But it doesn't leave me with the bellyache or, or the pink pea in the morning. <laughs> So I, I truly appreciate the yellow beet and it's just for that. And I have pickled them and they're lovely. They're very pretty. They're bright yellow. Yay. And for the carrots, I'm mostly a freezer girl. So I parboil them. I slice them and parboil them and package them up in um, amounts that are ready for a soup or a stew to go. Um, so my freezer is 
three quarters full now. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, bok choy and flour. So I grew bok choy this year for the first time and I was thrilled. Got lots of fresh bok choy like you would get at the grocery store. And um, I didn't grow too many, but I had enough that I could leave them over to see what would happen if they went to flower and they did. So I don't think you can see the little bee in there, but we've got those bicolored bumbles in there, just enjoying the flowers. And um, they did actually come out with seed pods for me. So they look the same as an arugula or um, the, the, I have mustard in there as well. I don't know if you can see that and I let them go to seed. So it's a long thin tube with a row of little black seeds in there. So my bok choy and flower gave uh, something for the pollinators to do late in the season. And I am actually getting seeds to share with the library this year. I'm so excited. So on to the next slide. Oh yeah, field dried peas. I had peas, peas, peas coming on when I was trying to do other things. And um, these are my favorites, Dalve peas. They're um, a late producer. So I have two other kinds that are more like a spring pea and you can harvest them off and we ate lots of them. And the dalvays I usually save for the freezer, but this year they're mostly seeds for next year. So that's fair enough. And they were in behind my corn hanging off of a fence here and you can see them drying up nicely, they're little brown pods. So nature did her thing on her own and I pulled them all out before they started splitting and um, I put them in my drying bin. So this is just my note to myself because I'm trying to do this very hard up here to become self-sustaining and I let some of my uh, produce continue their life cycle. So where I would normally harvest off some of the vegetables with the bok choy, my mustard greens and my peas, I let them finish out their cycle in the garden so that I can save seeds and be ready for next year. Um, COVID, I don't know if you've experienced it, but with COVID, I found it difficult to get the seeds that I wanted. It was, it was really um, made me nervous about the way things are going in the future. And so if I can become self-sustaining and share with neighbors, I don't have to worry. So that was my goal. And I'm really happy with my results. Field drying like the peas is a good option, but sometimes you have to have alternative methods to finish your harvest process indoors and away from the fall rains like we've been having recently and cold temperatures, which are coming up again next week. And don't forget frost is a killer. Next slide. So this is me. We're enjoying our tomato sandwiches, uh, but I really like these tomatoes. And so I've picked out some of the seeds out of the top and left them on a paper towel. And I took them out to the drying cupboard to see what they would do. <laughs> this is me and Eva and our video, I guess, of the drying <laughs> cupboard. Yeah, this still, okay, just wait, it gets better, guys. Okay, so this is, uh, we've got a little video here about Juliet's drying cupboard, which we thought would be really interesting for people. And this mm. is how she dries uh, seeds, but on plants. So we're missing uh -oh. volume. Oh, I have volume. You guys don't have the volume? No. Nope. Nope. <gasps> oh, no. How do I? Hmm. Well, I can tell you what the crazy lady's saying. If we oh, my goodness. <laughs> I wonder why there's. Hmm. 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 OK, a mystery. It is a mystery. It should it should be. Hmm. OK, well, yeah. I can hear it. <laughs> so this is a cupboard I picked up down the road at a neighbor's. I got it for 10 or 20 bucks. And it's just a chest of drawers, but we drilled holes in the back, as you can see, and put screening in front to keep the nasty little pests out. And you can see the third row down, there's a drawer there where the holes don't quite align, but it still works. The drawers inside also have holes in them. So we'll pull this top one out and we have mint drying and you see the holes in the back and then there's screening in the bottom. So we've cut a hole and we laid screening on top so that nothing will fall through. 
And um, the herbs can dry there. So this is just peppermint, chocolate peppermint drying nicely. Um, I'm gonna show you how I strip them off the stalks. You can use lock, stock and barrel in your tea, but I like to just take off the leaves. I don't know. I have a thing about bones and hairs and stalks. So, <laughs> so this is just me. And I use the flowers too. I don't mind the flowers in the tea and the leaves. And then um, I stripped them out and I gave Eva a nice bag of peppermint tea because she's been going through the uh, colds and things that kids get at school. It's been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Glad you like it. So that's me just labeling a bag because the tea is really dry. It's been in there for three or four weeks. I'm safe to put it in a plastic bag and then it'll go up in my tea cupboard in the kitchen. So it's ready to go. Interesting. Never seen that. The other way to deal with herbs is to tie the stalks all together and hang them in your basement, and I've done that too. But I just found it was just as fast and easy, and sort of out of the way here. I'm not looking at them every day, wondering if they're ready. I'll come back in a couple of weeks, and they will be. So that's our chocolate mint tea. Second drawer, more tea, but this one's spearmint. And I was explaining to Eva the difference. Peppermint is a cooling mint and spearmint is a heating mint. So if you've got an ailment, depending if you've got chills, take spearmint. But if you've got a fever, take peppermint. Oh, surprise, I've got mushrooms in here. So these are some honey mushrooms that I gathered up and I've laid them out in the same way and they enjoy the same drying process. They're not in the sun, they get nice airflow and they dry nicely. And I think I found a little fly friend in there that we tossed away. <laughs> oh, so here's those tomato seeds we had earlier. And I did leave them a bit long in here so they were stuck on the paper towel. But you can actually use the paper towel and take that and the seed as well. And when you're going to start them planting, the paper towel will act like a moisture wick for you and um, hold the moisture next to the seed to help it germinate. And these ones are um, big beef, beef steak tomatoes. <laughs> See, stuck, but mm -hmm. it'll go in the package with the seed. And then again, labeling the package is important because you want to know years down the road if it was from 2022 or 2019 or whatever, um, it might be too old. And especially for tea for me, because some packages get put at the back of the cupboard, it's too high for me to reach nicely. And so I'll clean one day and I'll realize that I've got 2018 tea in there and I don't need it. So I can let that go to the compost and just use the fresh stuff. So that's it, labeled with the date and everything. <laughs> <clears throat> Peppers. So I've eaten the pepper, but I cut out the top and I've saved the seeds and I let them dry out in the cupboard and I just sprinkle them off and I make note of the, the brand of pepper that I had. So this one will be the, the new ace pepper. And um, you can see I've got green pepper there too. It's green on the top. The seeds still ripened up nicely. They're a good color and they're dry. So we can utilize both. And then um, in behind my hand there, you can see a pepper that was damaged in the garden and it had a, a bit of rotting flesh, but I can still get seeds out of there. The rotting is a natural process. And so if that were left in the garden, the pepper fruit would rot, the seeds would be exposed and they'd land on all of that and they would still grow. So you don't have to be afraid of that. We'll just take a couple of those seeds too. <laughs> <laughs> But there are black seeds in there. I wouldn't, and even in nature, they probably wouldn't produce for us. So 
Now what's this lady talking about? I think you're talking about um, labeling the seed packet and how important it is, that kind of thing in this little Okay, with portion. the dates and all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, peas. These are those field dried peas. And as you can see, some of the pods are exploding out. Now, what you're not going to be able to hear is the nicely dried seed rattling <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the wood. So you can hear it. I'm dropping it and it's going ping, ping, ping. It's nicely dried. And you know that they're good to go in the package without any worry. And that's them, the Dalve peas. <laughs> and oh, tobacco. just for fun, we do have tobacco growing in the front garden. I had some at home too. And Dolores said to take the leaves off the bottom as they're turning yellow and then turn them every day so that they dry nicely both sides. And so here we have some nicely dried tobacco leaves to be used um, as the, uh, the smoking herb that they would become or for gifting um, in, in the native lore. If you're going to take something from nature, you have to give a gift of appreciation and tobacco is the first gift. And so that's usually what you would give. Now we're on to beans. So these beans, I had to get them out of the garden, but they weren't quite ready to go. So here they are rather green and they're taking forever to dry out, even in my drying cupboard. So what I'm going to do here is take them out of the green pod and hope that they'll dry better without the pod on them. They're already passed. So it's just a shot in the dark. I'd hope it works, but they pop out nicely. And so far they seem to be drying out while I've got them on top of the cupboard right now, just to watch. But that's it. Oh, they pop, nice, nice seeds, nicely developed. One wasn't so good, we'll let him go. Is Beth on tonight? I know she saves peas, peas and wins. <laughs> Prizes at the fair. I think she was planning on it, but she's not on the call right now. So I'm not sure if she wasn't able to make it. I haven't okay. heard from her. Okay. Does anybody have questions about uh, Juliet's drawing cupboard? I have a question. It's Carol. So in the spring, do you just put those dried? um like the peas do you just put them in little starter pots and start them going or do you have to get them moist again i do peas direct because they're pretty hardy on their own and um so i just like if i open a seed packet from the store or i use my own pea seeds directly into the garden they go they're resilient they can take all the frost and snow that happens in the spring regardless <clears throat> and when they start they do only do it when they're ready Okay. So when I was harvesting these, six peas fell in the ground, and I thought, I wonder what would happen, because they had been rained on, they couldn't come up here to the cupboard, I wonder what would happen if I planted them. So I'm watching to see, because they're a cold start, maybe I'll get fall peas. I don't know. Ah. <laughs> not in the dark. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to do experiments like that's that. A sh that's a Sean move right there. That's why we had tomatoes growing in our, in our stairwell in February last year. Um, Yay, Sean. <laughs> Yay, Sean. <laughs> so Shirley asks, is it advisable to use a dehydrator to dry seed pods to speed things up if we don't have a drying drawer? Oh. No. I, I'm not the one to ask. For me, I would just let them try to dry as naturally as possible. The, the hydrator for me would be to speed up the mushrooms or to speed up your tea products or um, to, to dry out, I don't know if you could dry out carrots, things like that, but for seeds, because you want them to maintain their life center, I would just let them go as naturally as possible. Especially if the dry hydrator uses heat, I wouldn't use that at all. But if it's just air blowing past, you might get away with it. There's an experiment for you, Shirley. Give it a go. Get back to us with the results. <laughs> yes, please. But your your seed drying cupboard also wasn't a difficult project. It was my it was a oh, chest no. of drawers, right? And cutting cutting parts out yes. of it for ventilation. Yes, it just took um, a saber saw 
and half a day and we had it ready to go. It was great. That's awesome. Thanks, Shirley. Let us know about those lupins. Yes, please. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions about the drawing cover that Juliet has? Okay, onwards we go. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, wait, it's going to play again. Okay, here we go. Oh, no. <laughs> With that sound again. Okay, um, so these are, this is just another method that Julia had talked about of, of drawing your seed pods, um, was hanging them, and you can hang tea as well. So these are uh, radish pods from the library, and they were mostly brown already. There's just a little tiny bit of green on the ends, so uh, they are hanging in behind the herb um rack at the library and they're just hanging from um, shower hooks i'm so glad to see that eva because i had seeds like that in the garden and i assumed they were radishes i didn't know but i've saved them and we'll see what grows <laughs> <laughs> well these ones are definitely radishes because there was whole radishes at their bases that we forgot to to pick there was a few that that were planted too close together and they just went to seed so that was perfect. Thank you. Yeah, the radishes Excellent. were all planted by the teenagers. Um, yeah. a, there's also um, arugula, I think, at the back of this picture, too, that's a seed pod. It was just another plant that was allowed to go to seed. Um, we grew it inside mm -hmm. in the herb ladder and had arugula for a while. And then when it started getting really lanky, uh, Cormac moved it outside um, and then it flowered. And we just kind of let it... Um, get pods then I guess yeah. yeah what little we know okay so frost warning we all had this last week um so if anybody wants to share what they do when they uh hear that there's going to be a frost warning and I know Juliet advises to even when it's not quite a frost warning to still cover right mm -hmm. my place seems to be unique um, nobody else, if it says it's going to be four degrees, everybody else, like even Jane, oh yeah, it was about four degrees. I have to take four degrees off whatever they say. And I guess it's the wind currents here, but we get hard frost. So I've been covered up for a lot of September and I'm really glad that I did because we've had several hard frosts, but my tomatoes and peppers are still great. <laughs> and that was just with covering them? Well, what I did, we had an old carport that wasn't really um, doing its job as a carport anymore. And so I didn't let my husband get rid of it. Um, I said, let me use it. So I cut the, I took the legs pieces off. So I just have the top section and I used the tarp and I have it draped over my um, two rows. So I have peppers and tomatoes, some onions, some Swiss chard and things like that underneath the tarp. And they're still great. They're still doing wonderful. That's awesome. <laughs> Does anybody else do anything for when there's a frost warning? Any any good plans or right suggestions? I have a plan. Whenever I hear that there's frost, I say that's my time. <laughs> I pull up everything. I get all the pots emptied. They're all washed, cleaned back in the garage. And I put all my harvest on the counter and I pickle it or do whatever. And that is the end of my season. I've been too many times stuck in the wintry snow trying to clean up my pots. So I've, I've just decided that's the best route for me and it works. I have a Carol uh, question for you, Carol. You're mostly a container gardener, are you not? Yes, I am. Is that because you're mostly rock around your place or is that just a, a preference? Uh, it was just a preference. My husband has a huge big garden and it was just unmanageable as far as I was concerned. And I like, <laughs> I like small gardening. So I just have a, I have a, what's called a veg truck and I have about eight pots and I just grow tomatoes, peppers, onions, uh, peas, beans, kale, Swiss chard, and all of that stuff. And I, I really enjoy that. It's just a small area and not very much weeding. I don't know why, I just don't get weeds. So it's it's what I like to do. And it's right by the house. 
So I just go out every morning and with my cup of tea and enjoy the garden. Hey, that's a true potager's garden. There, that's a name, potager's garden. It was meant to be just outside the kitchen door. So good on you. Well done. Yeah. Um, Mary, Mary had something to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mary says, if it has been a light frost, sometimes you can save a plant by watering with cold water first thing in the morning. That's interesting. I agree. Been there, done it. I Thanks, like it. Mary. That's awesome. <laughs> Bless you. Oh, thank you. <sighs> Okay, so we'll move on. This is just a picture of bed sheets that are clipped on. Can we just get back to that cold water? What does the cold water, if this is the, the morning after the frost, you put cold water in? Yes. You can water at night too in hopes that it helps, but in the morning, um, it's if you had frostbite, they're gonna wanna wake up your frostbitten digits slowly. And I think they use ice water, do they not? but they slowly warm up your digits to try to save them oh. because, um, because the skin cells are frozen or the plant cells are frozen and you don't want them to burst. Right. So if you wake them up slowly, the ice inside might melt with the water outside. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any more discussion about the frost coming in for our plants? We have frost warnings tomorrow night and Wednesday night. Brilliant. Oh, just a side note. If you're growing parsnips or rutabagas, you need the frost because that brings out the sweet. Hmm. Oh, and I know that Libby uh, pulls up her parsnips in the spring. So she leaves them in her garden all winter and then pulls them up in the spring. And she said they're lovely and sweet and tasty. Hmm. There you go. Another vegetable that's um, good after it's been frozen is broth, um, Brussels sprouts. If you uh, let the Brussels sprouts get frozen a time oh. or two, nicer to eat as well. Hmm. Oh, that's good to know. Thanks, Jane. Um, and Mary oh, says, make it care. That far. <laughs> Mary said some with carrots, same with okay. carrots left over in winter, in the winter garden are really sweet. Yeah, and I think there's a few others too, yeah. So I guess the frost isn't all bad. No. <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh, so this oh, is another no. video we probably will have. Carol, I'm so sad that there's no audio because you did so well. Oh, I love this video. I'm so oh, sad. Oh, dear. Are you, do you, would you like to do your own yes. um, little voiceover? I will talk through it. I'll lip, you, lip read. You got this. It's eight minutes long. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. oh, it's fine. It's fine. You did so good, too, Carol. She does this beautiful little garden tour and then a recipe. Oh, it's delightful. I'm so sad. Okay, so this is my patio garden and I'm, it was a few mornings ago and I decided I was going to clean up the garden so I thought I better take a video and show what my garden looks like and then I'll show the after and then I'll do a little recipe about slow roasted tomatoes. So I don't know what I'm talking about right now but oh I think I'm just saying this is what makes me happy and and it's manageable. So there's my uh, beautiful impatience over there. They did really well this year. And then there's my tomato plants. And for some reason, this is a clipped tomato plant. So I clipped all the leaves off just so that the sun could get to the tomatoes. And for some reason this year, it just didn't work. So normally I pull 10 or 12 of these grape sized tomatoes off my plant every morning, but this year it, it for some reason. I don't know. I think I just didn't get enough sun. Something was wrong anyway. And there is a picture of my veg trug and that's spelled V-E-G-T-R-U-G. -G. And we bought that from Home Depot. And I think it's 18 inches deep in the center. And there's a, 
there's I'm just showing that I've got uh, Swiss chard and I only have four uh, green bean plants, but that was more than enough. And I ended up pickling two, two jars of um, beans just because we had so many beans. And there's my one kale plant. And I'm telling you, the thing was a monster. It just, it, it was just the right growing conditions. And then I have onions beside it that I've pulled already and more the two other bean plants. Here's my petunias and another tomato plant. And there I have some peppers and oh, some of those uh, bonnet peppers. Don't know what their names are. And then I have um, herbs. So parsley, basil, um, rosemary, and there's some more red peppers. And then down below, I have a cucumber plant that was really good. And there's my lettuce garden. So I just keep planting lettuce all summer long. I just keep cutting it and using it. And there is a view of scotch bonnet peppers, right? There's the view of the lake. So it's, a, it's just a relaxing hobby that I have. And it was really cold that day that I was doing this. So I think I'm gonna tell you, oh the, yeah, so there it is, there's the after. So I've, um, I've cleaned up all the pots, everything's gone. I got the leaf blower out and blew it all. I, I saved the uh, Swiss chard and the kale just because the Swiss chard I find just does better in the garden. And the uh, kale, it will go till snowfall. And we just, we use it for um, kale chips and in soups and stews. And there, uh, that's the patio. And there I'm going inside because it's chilly. And there's our barbecue, dining room, and our kitchen. Yes, I will. There is, there's a little bit of my harvest that I pulled out that day. So I do get things out of the garden. There's my pickled peppers and the squashes I didn't get in out of our garden, but that's out of Jack's garden. And there's some parsley and thyme that I just have on hand. And because my tomatoes didn't do so well, I am using store-bought tomatoes. And with gardening, that just happens. Sometimes I just had it in my bonnet that I was gonna make these tomatoes this year. I ran out over the winter. So I was deciding to do it. So I thought I'm just gonna buy them and that's the end of that. There's my dill pickles. I just, oh, right there I'm, I'm just saying that I do things in small quantities. So all I, I just made two jars of dill pickles. It takes me about an hour and a bit and that's it. And I don't fuss with big quantities. I just, I just do what's right for me. Okay. And I'm saying that's a chilly day out there. <laughs> I remember that part. <laughs> okay, here's, here's me doing my tomatoes. So <laughs> this is funny. So I, I'm telling you that I'm using a serrated tomato, I call it a tomato knife. And it makes such a difference when you're cutting tomatoes. I don't know if everybody does it, but it's a miracle. I just figured that out this year. So I'm very excited. So I just cut up my tomatoes in half, very simple. Some people take out the seeds and the juice. I don't because I like a juicier uh, slow cooked tomato. So I leave the seeds in there and the juice. I don't, I don't scrape it out. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> okay, so now I've finished cutting up all the tomatoes and I just, I don't get fussy about it. I just flip over most of them and they, it doesn't really matter which, if you, if you take too much time. I used to hand flip everyone and then hand do garlic. And this year I just throw it on. So I use the jarred garlic just for ease. And also I find it a gentler taste. So raw garlic, it's just a little bit too strong for me. So I just use the chopped up garlic that you get from the grocery store. I put some pepper on. And I use these tomatoes with uh, pasta. I use it a lot with garlic bread. I just do a little borsan cheese 
uh, on a crusty roll and then put the tomatoes on top and then put it in the oven at 350 for about 10 minutes. And it is beautiful. So there I put pepper on and now I'm sprinkling olive oil. And again, just spread it around, no fuss. And then we put it in the oven for uh, about an hour and a half to two hours at 300 degrees. So I was doing it at a slower um, oven just to do it slow roasted, but then I discovered that three, 350 was a bit too much, so 300. And you will be able to smell your tomatoes as they're getting ripe or dried out. So there they are. Oh, they're so delicious. We were having pork chops that night and I just served them just over top of a barbecued pork chop and it just makes everything so much tastier. There's the end result. I cooked them a little bit. Uh, the oven was just a bit too hot at 350. So 300 is good. And then after that cools, I do use a propane oven. Uh, and I, I didn't notice that it was a dryer heat, but it could be. So I put, I, once this sheet has cooled, I put it in the freezer and then I sort of segmented out and I made three, I think I made three bags of this. I put the date on, I put them in the freezer and when company's coming over, I get a, I make some homemade bread, put some garlic butter or borsan cheese or mozzarella and put some of those on and they are so tasty, so good. And I have a feeling that is it. Yeah. So that's Ooh. it. I'm just, I'm just going to look at, uh, do I use grape tomatoes? Any kind of tomatoes are good. When I first learned this recipe, they were using Roma tomatoes. So, and it was just a much bigger tomato, but it was, um, uh, the Roma tomatoes were basically on a baguette. You could put one Ro Roman tomato and it was a nice appetizer like that. So that's that. Any kind of tomatoes. I just find as long as you're with your oven and, and you stay by it, you can pretty much experiment with things like that. I put basil on it. I've been known to put parsley or uh, thyme, whatever I have available. Also, Sometimes at the very end, I put black olives in the oven. So they kind of dry out a little bit with the tomatoes and then you've got a, a really nice combination. That's it. Nice job, thank you. Thank you for doing that without the audio. <laughs> that was really well done, oh my goodness. Ah, oh, terrible, I'm so sorry about the audio. I, I didn't realize that it wouldn't come through on um, um, screen sharing. Um, and you just freeze that, right? You just break it up? Yeah, I just segmented into about uh, three, three sections, but you can do the whole thing in one bag. It doesn't matter, they kind of break apart easily when they're frozen. Cool. Very Does anybody nice. have any more questions about those? I know I'm going to try it with all the tomatoes from the library, <laughs> with some of the tomatoes from the library. Yeah. Oh, just one, uh, one little thing about my uh, potted plants in the, on the patio. I do put some plastic bottles in the bottom of my pots, just so I'm not filling it up with soil, not wasting all that soil. So I put a couple, um, juice bottles and stuff in the bottom and then the soil on top. And the juice bottles actually uh, work as a drainage system as well. So um, then I just, I put probably about uh, 10 or 12 inches of soil on top of the plastic bottles. And it works, they're not so heavy that way, much more manageable. I like it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody, oh, before it starts playing again, does anybody have any more questions about um, Juliet's 
or not Julia's, <laughs> about Carol's garden beds, her raised garden beds. But before I... Juliet just okay. asked if I use a water... Hang on. Do you awesome. use a, a bottle to water with? I just use a shower, uh, one of those cans, watering cans. What I meant was you can bury a bottle with the, with the, uh, the mouthpiece down and the bottom right. cut out up and you can pour water in there so it feeds at the bottom instead of wetting the dirt on the top of your potter. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, no, I, I just what, wondered if you did. I don't, but I, I know that with the pots, you have to stay with it. You can't leave them. Yeah. Some, sometimes you can't leave them more than a day. So when we yeah. travel, I've got a neighbor next door that uh, she's just a teenager. So she comes over and waters. So that is one real disadvantage of the potted garden that you, you do have to stay on top of it. Here, here's a couple of cheats you might want to try, Carol. Um, I haven't because I'm, I'm an avid waterer. But if you take a kitchen sponge and you put it in the bottom of your pot, um, it will hold moisture. So when you water, it'll suck up and it'll stay wet um, for a while. And you can also use the florist green, you know, that stuff they, if you yeah. get a floral arrangement, that green stuff, yeah. and it'll do the same thing. It's like a water sponge. Oh, great idea. Thank you. There are suggestions. I've never done it myself, but I was just sharing what I've read. <laughs> yeah. Well, makes sense. I also wanted to comment that I like how you mentioned the scale that you that you take on. You don't do a lot of canning. You do just enough and you do you have it. You it's very like easy to maintain. And that seems really smart. Yeah. And it's not overwhelming. I, I used to throw out a lot of stuff because I just couldn't eat it. And it it uh, it it bothered me that I had so much stuff. So now I just do a couple. Yeah. And I give jam away at Christmas time. So I do a lot of jam. So I just do a bottle of strawberry jam for a Christmas present or a uh, housewarming or, you know, when you go to somebody's house at Christmas time, I take some jam and that seems to work. Nice. Yeah. Okay. If nobody else has any more questions about this slide about Carol's garden, I'm going to scoot it to the next slide which might be the last slide actually, Who? okay. No, not quite. Um, so this is a discussion about how do we store our produce for the fall? So I know we've touched on a couple things here. Uh, Juliet's drying cupboard, we've talked about briefly. We've talked about um, how Jane stores her carrots. Um, and we've talked about um, preserves and that kind of thing with, with Carol. So does anybody else want to share about how what methods they have found to be really effective for storing their produce for the winter? Eva, I could probably tell you how, what we do with our potatoes. Um, this year we didn't have a lot of rains, so the potatoes didn't um, come out of the ground particularly covered with dirt. But anyway, when we dig the potatoes, we leave them in the, in the garden for the, the rest of that day, gather them up, and a couple of days later, we dump them out on a tarp and check them out for rotten ones, ones that might be going bad, some that might have got scurfed with the fork or the shovel, whatever we were using. And we do that two or three times and any extra dirt that may be on the potatoes comes off as well. And then we store them in a cold storage room that we have in our basement. It's actually underneath the um, the entrance to the house upstairs and that cold storage room is lined on the outside wall partially lined with styrofoam in case we get a really cold winter with not a lot of snow cover on the outside of the house and it keeps the things from freezing in there so the the other things that we store in there would be um, the onions and again with the onions when we pull the onions we tend to let them dry for several days you know take them in and out of the garage, dump them out on something. And um, it just gives them a chance to dry well before we put them away. And we take off the dirty outer leaves, cut the tops off, 
twist them usually and cut the tops off and the roots. And I usually store them in a, in a wire basket in the cold storage room on a shelf. Uh, in the cold storage as well are, are shelves for the canning uh, pickles and that sort of thing that we, we also do. Um, I was telling you before about the, uh, how I store the carrots. The, the one thing I don't store in those bags are the small carrots because I find they don't keep very well. So when they're first pulled, I'll wash those all up and scrub them well. And I grind them all up and make carrot cakes and store the carrot cakes in the freezer. So we have them for the winter. Um, I don't know what, what else much to say about, you know, we like we use our cold, our cold storage and, our, and the spare refrigerator. Back in the day, I guess a lot of people had root cellars and or they stored their uh, potatoes, beets and carrots in in bins, either in a corner of the barn or perhaps in the in a dirt cellar under their house. And and that kept them really well. Um, Juliet's asking about the squash. We're just the last few years have been growing more squash and we just keep it in the garage as long as we can and try and use it up before it gets too desperately cold in there. We actually put a fire on in the garage. We have a stove there that, uh, that keeps the garage from totally freezing in the winter. So the squash does, does keep reasonably well. So the, um, the root cellars that people used to have, I was talking to someone not long ago and they said that uh, there is somebody locally who has in fact, made a root cellar just in the last couple of years and is finding that it works quite well. So those are just extra little tips on, on how to, uh, to store those things. The um, peas and beans we freeze. And I haven't tried freezing carrots like Juliet has, but maybe that's something I could do in the future. So we have enough, our, our, our garden is totally harvested now. And uh, we have enough potatoes and onions and carrots to see us through until spring and lots of peas and beans in the freezer. That is excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mary says that you can freeze whole tomatoes. And when they thaw, the skin peels right off. Do you have to um, parboil them, Mary, to do that? No, okay. Um, and then Juliet says that her grandma kept a pail of water in her root cellar to maintain the temperature and moisture. And she claims it kept her apples just right. That is so cool, actually. Hmm. Yeah, we find we can't store our apples in our cold room, but we can store them in the garage in coolers, you know, the, the coolers you would take on a camping trip or whatever. And, um, and they keep quite well that way as well. How long do you think they keep for? We've had them, you know, purchasing them in the fall and being able to keep them right through until about March. Wow. Wow. And where do you buy them from? They, do they have a, a, an apple guy that comes into Perry Sound anymore? No, I don't think so, Carol. Um, we have tried to go down to St. Jacob's in the fall and purchase them down there at the market. Oh, great. And um, if not, the last couple of years, my daughter lives in Prince Edward County near Picton, and they have apple orchards down there, and we, we have bought apples there, but not in very large quantity, so. Oh, that's great. I'm going to St. Jacob's in a couple of weeks if anybody wants anything. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and added to Mary's comment about the tomatoes, I freeze a lot of the grape tomatoes. I don't like cherry tomatoes because I find they split too easily, but the grape tomatoes are really nice in the garden. And I, when those are ripe and picked, we just wash them and, and throw them in bags in the freezer. They're great for putting into soup or uh, chili or whatever you might be cooking up that requires tomatoes, so. Hmm. Does anybody else have ideas or suggestions? Does anybody dehydrate maybe? 
Um, I know that's what we always did growing up. We had an apple orchard and uh, we dehydrated the apples, huge quantities mm -hmm. of them, and also um, baked a lot of apple crisp and froze those as well. But we would have so, so many apples every year here. And, and Jane, back to your um, cooler thing. So you keep the coolers in the garage, but you, you tend to put a fire on every now and then so you, they're not getting frozen. Well, the fire is more to keep the pipes from freezing, Carol, as opposed to keeping the, the apples. But, but anyway, um, we put them, we, we found, we just tried a lot of different things. And um, we have found that, that getting the apples, putting them in a plastic bag that's not sealed, but in a plastic bag and inside the coolers, that the garage, and we keep them away from the doors as far, like we keep our wood in the garage. So we keep them as far back to the wood pile as we can. Okay. And, and we've just had really good luck doing that with them. But, you know, you have to have good apples to begin with. Right. Um, uh, you know, they can't be windfalls or anything like that. They won't keep, but uh, anyway. And normally Macintosh? I prefer the Mutsus. They're a green apple. Okay. Um, something that's a hard, hard apple. A Macintosh are a little bit soft, I think, for something like that. Right. We have been able to keep um, delicious. We had somebody give us quite a few delicious one year, and they kept quite well. Okay, terrific. Um, somebody asked me when I was doing my presentation about kale chip recipe, and I think what we're, Eva, do you want to talk about... Um, the recipe sharing that we had, we had uh, thought we might do? Yeah, so we thought if everybody has good recipes for the produce that they get from their garden, or even if they don't get it from their garden, if it's something that they just like to make that's really delicious, if you could send it to me at the library, if you could email it or bring it in like written down, that's fine, I can type it up for you. Um, and then we can distribute it to all the people who've been taking the, these workshops throughout the year. Um, and we can share kind of recipes and put together, a, not really a recipe book, but a little booklet maybe about different ideas people have. Right. And that could be available. Likely if we get it together, if people send recipes over the next couple of weeks, we could have it for October's workshop on garlic All and right. putting your gardens to bed, so. Yeah, does anybody have any follow-up? Or do you want to talk to, about, to the kale now? Or do you want to leave it for that? Um, I'll leave it to, to that. But I think I just got the recipe off the internet. So I'll just, um, I'll just submit that. But if you just looked up, look up baked kale, uh, there's a lot of recipes. It's basically just olive oil, salt, and just put it in the oven and add a high heat. And it turns out to be crispy and tasty appetizers. Very nice. Oh, um, Mary says, I dehydrated tomatoes once dried. Oh, okay. And nice chips. Also rehydrate the tomatoes for sauces. That is such a good idea. It would be shelf stable for quite a few months then. Save on some freezer space. Does it, anybody have any questions about the to this whole topic or any comments or stories they'd like to share? Maybe some recipes, ideas. Feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. That's welcome too, or you can use the chat if you're more comfortable. Um, two things, Eva. One, I posted a question just to put a feeler out to see if anybody was interested in a workshop on how to make um, wax sealers, you know, the wax seat, sheet sealers for things like teas or um, lemons or whatever in your fridge when you're partway used. And we've had good response. And also, if you're going to do recipes, I suggest maybe we could make a recipe book for Whitestone and we could sell it to raise funds for gardening and our food security or just have it in the library for checkout. That's a great idea. I love it. You're Sean's here now, so there's going to be an echo as he repeats what I say. Hi, Sean. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Sean we want him back. 
to do another workshop. He ran down to his plants in the basement. He was, he oh. ran through, he got, he finally got Delilah to bed, I guess. Um, okay. So he's, he's been um, spending the last few days hauling all of his plants inside. Oh, so right. He is repotting everything. Okay, I put that kale, it's called baked kale chips, and it's on the website All Recipes. All Recipes is one word, and that's what I used. And, and a little fun fact, uh, if you buy kale or if you take it from the garden, if you um, just cut the ends off evenly and put them in a measuring cup or something solid and put a little bit of water, like a half half of the jar of water and put it in the fridge. The, the Swiss chard, kale, all of those broccoli, all of those vegetables will last a lot longer. As long as you, it's just like celery, as long as you keep water in the container. That was solid advice. <laughs> that, no, that's, you can do that with um, herbs as well. Yeah. Mary, yeah, the garlic one's going to be online as well. So you're welcome to join in. And if you know anybody even out of the area that wants to attend, they are welcome to as well. You can send them the, the Zoom information as well. The more, the merrier. Um, another way for the herbs um, is you can, if you, if you're, if you did the herb, garden workshop back in February and have a lot of herbs now like we certainly do at the library you can um, freeze them in olive oil Ooh. in yeah and you can in freeze them in an ice cube tray and use them that way Eva if I could just add something more about potato storage yes do not wash the potatoes before they're stored we, we tend to think, you know, that we should wash everything before we put it away. And I do wash the carrots. And I often wondered why, so I Googled it. And apparently if you wash the potatoes and take, because they're, they're grown underground. And so they have that little film of, of dirt on them, which, you know, will eventually dry. But if you wash them and don't dry them perfectly well, they may tend to grow bacteria and so on. And then your potatoes are ruined. So right. just something to keep in mind. Don't wash your potatoes before you put them away. Just oh, wow. Of, okay. Yeah. You can dust the dirt off or knock it off if there's a lot, but, but don't wash them. That's good. Ha! Huh, question, Jane. Is that <laughs> why they don't want us to wash our potatoes when we enter them in the fair? Don't I'm wash them, so. just brush them off and put them in that way. I'm assuming so, Julia, ha! because uh, that's what I read on on um, on on Google was that you, you can brush them with a soft cloth, but do not wash them because you you know they tend they've got little crevices, might not dry out as well, and um, and therefore you know you're risking losing your potatoes. So now we know. Oh, now we know. <laughs> Oh, and just a shout out for people that are going into the library, please. Um, if you've got an excess of one type of squash, uh, you can bring it in and swap it out for another kind of squash out in front of the library. There is a, there's bushel baskets that Jane and Julia brought in and with different types of squashes in them. They've got more than squashes at this point too. So if you need any other produce, they're there. Um, and you're welcome to add to the, to the bushel baskets and take from the bushel baskets as well. Great, thank you. And um, I might have a million tomatoes coming your way. Oh no. Uh, big beef and Roma style tomatoes, just because my plants are on hard and they're just choking me. Perfect. And I have to do something with them. There's no room in my freezer, but they might not all be red, red, red. So if people know that you can take three or four tomatoes and put them in a sandwich bag and scrunch up the end and just let them sit for anywhere up to a week, they will ripen up and be the most beautiful red tomatoes ever. And you can enjoy those on your sandwiches. 
we're going to have a rule now. You're not actually allowed to enter the library or leave the library without um, taking tomatoes with you. It's just, that's going to have to be the rule. You can get a book and you also get, you also get several <laughs> tomatoes. cups of tomatoes. <laughs> in hindsight, planting 12 tomato plants in the gardens um, was a mistake. <laughs> so, it's a little excessive. Um, so many tomatoes. Shirley says, um, I've read that you can put potatoes in sand to keep. Does anybody recommend this? Has anybody tried it? That's what people always did in the past, Shirley. Um, they, they would put a layer of sand, a layer of potatoes, a layer of sand and potatoes. If you have that in a, in a spot in your cellar to do that, by all means. And carrots, carrots and beets yeah. work that way. My potatoes, I basically just dig them up out of the garden, throw them in the bag, dirt and all, and take them into the house and put them in a cold corner, dirt and all, because it's like they're still underground, uh, but they're not going to grow. So I think the sand on them helps maintain moisture at their choice of level. So they're not too wet, they're not too dry. And I keep my potatoes right through till March or April, but then we've eaten them all and, and we need more. <laughs> we had potatoes right through until June this year from our garden, our last year's garden. And then I had to buy a bag and they were absolutely disgusting. It was horrible. Oh. Oh. We, we did without eating potatoes for a little while until the new ones came on. <laughs> yeah, that was Sean nothing. last year when our, our chicken stopped laying, when it was got a little bit too cold. I bought um, an, a carton of eggs and he was deeply affronted. <laughs> he, he was quickly turned to the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <clears throat> can I ask a question about basil? Can, can I just pick my basil leaves off and layer it with olive oil and freeze them? think so yeah because I mean, I've done it in mm -hmm. I've done it but cut them up I haven't done them whole yeah I just don't feel like making pesto a whole bunch of pesto right now <laughs> but I just thought if I layered it with the yeah and then I could put it in tomato sauce or whatever mm -hmm. you could likely do it even without the olive oil yeah like the olive oh, oil I no okay Basil is so temperature sensitive. I mean, yeah. look where it comes from. Um, and if you put it in the fridge and your fridge is too cold, it'll turn black. Oh. So the olive oil is critical. Um, I would do pesto just because pesto is pesto. Yeah, I, mean, uh, yeah, I know. I, I just don't feel, well, maybe I can just layer it and just put them in jars and put them in the fridge. Not freeze it, but just put it in the fridge with the olive oil. You can freeze pesto too. Yeah, I, yeah. You can freeze it once it's made into pesto. I just was kind of <laughs> yeah. not wanting to make pesto right now. Maybe I'll have to make it. Yeah. Wendy, one year I just got all my basil leaves, and I didn't want to make pesto either. And yeah. I just uh, put them in a hand blender with olive oil. Yeah, blended them and put them in little snack size baggies and put them in the freezer. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm. I'm just trying, you know, being a little lazy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I may just well, do Well, like if you that. want to be lazy, just <laughs> harvest your plant and hang it upside down in a dark place. Well, it doesn't have to be dark, but no sunlight and it'll dry beautifully. And then you just crumble it and you have dried basil. Yeah. Yeah. I could do that, but I like, I love that fresh basil taste. <laughs> so, let's see. Yeah. But I may do, I may do what you say, Kel. Yeah. I may try that. That's or maybe I'll make pesto. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you do it in the olive oil, then you know there's no pine nuts or parmesan yeah. in them. And yeah, it, it worked for me. I just put them in like three or four tablespoons in every baggie. Just yeah. so yeah. it was handy, but not yeah. the whole pesto gig. Yeah, that's I just wasn't sure if I wanted to have, you know, I don't have that many pine nuts to begin with, but you can use walnuts too. I could use walnuts or pecans. But. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and Shirley says she doesn't have a cold area in her basement as it's all heated, you lucky dog. So I thought that sand may help. That's true. 
for the back to the sand with the carrots and the potatoes. I would be I would be more inclined to do what Jane does and put them get a fridge down in the basement and do that. We've tried all that sand stuff and it just doesn't seem to work. I think our basement would be too humid. Yeah, I think ours was too humid. They went, the carrots went black. And the carrot, the potatoes kind of shriveled up. So mm -hmm. it's tricky. I just wanted to mention that another good place for apples is Meaford area. All right. Meaford and Cremor. Uh, There's a place called Giffen's Weighing Station down there. And you can go in there and buy all types of apples for a good okay. price. Yeah, it's down near, um, well, kind of south of Meaford, like, you know, near that area. That's where I go anyway. I just, I just love it in there. It's Giffen's, I think it's G-I-F-F-E-N. Yes. And a nice trip at that. It's beautiful over there. Beautiful yeah. down there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so does anybody have any parting uh, questions or comments? I wanted to thank you, Jane. Uh, maybe for some something potatoes. for Shirley. Yeah. Uh, Shirley Maine with her heated basement. I have a heated basement, but I have a cupboard on a um, northwest wall, and it's not insulated except that it's just the cement wall. And it stays cool enough with the cupboard doors closed that I can keep my squash and my uh, rutabagas and things in there without much issue. I just have to watch the moisture content. Um, so if she could do that or build an insulated box, then you would sort of not have the house heat, but then you wouldn't have the outside frost either. And it might help. I don't know. It's worth a try. Great. Well, that was great. Good information. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody, for joining in on the call and for interacting and asking questions. That's been really helpful. Eva, did you want to mention any upcoming events at the library? Do I? Okay, we've got a um, we've got a workshop, a book art workshop on October the the fifth. It's yeah. the Wednesday, the first Wednesday. Yeah, the fifth of October. We're going to be making um, pumpkin autumn decor out of recycled books uh so that's next wednesday or a week wednesday and then in october um i think it's going to be the 27th i have to double check there's going to be a garlic workshop we'll be putting out emails about that too to everybody on the list um we'll be talking about planting garlic and how to do it and how to how to preserve it and also how to cut down your garden beds for the year and what to do with them. Am I missing one, Carol? No. I was, okay. No, that's good. I was going to say the um, the community, Perry Sound Community Care Center or whatever is doing lunch and learns yeah. the third, third Tuesday of every month. And I went to the last one and it was just a lot of fun. Nice people. There was a guitar player, good food. It was just a really nice social. So if anybody's interested in that, contact Larry Samus or one of us and we'll get you the info. Yeah, um, it's community support services out of um, Perry Sound that does it. So yeah, yeah, so it'll be once a month. Yeah, it's just a nice get together. And the library will be there. We'll have a little information table. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I hope we have a good night. Yeah, and, you guys too. And if you have any, um, if you have any feedback or anything like that, please send it. I'll be sending out a a survey after to all the everybody who participated. Uh, it's just we need feedback for the government. You know how it is. So, the lunch and learn is for seniors, surely. Yeah. Yes, they don't let kids or anybody in, do they? No, just me. Right. <laughs> I get to go. Um, but only because I'm from the library. Um, what is considered a senior? You know what? You'd have to uh, talk to Linda Taylor at Community Support yeah. Services. I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be pretty flexible. Or Janice Samus, who's local. Janice or Larry. But um, 
Hey, Marcella's on the line. Perfect. Hi, Marcella. Hi, Marcella. Yeah. They never questioned me, so I must look 65. Yeah, there you go. Whatever. Yeah, I don't, they're not like sticklers. No. Perfect, Shirley. You do that. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> I love it. Incognito. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Oh, that's funny. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure when the next one is. Do you know when the next one is, Carol? Uh, we we're waiting to hear about Beth Gora Matthews to see what her date is. Oh, the next no uh, for the lunch and learn. Yes, it's uh, hang on, it's the third Tuesday of every month. So the 18th. So it's, it's the 18th. Okay. So you'd want to contact them um, before that because you have to get added to their list. Yeah, Surely. you can get on their email distribution list and then every month they send you an email saying, are you going to show or not? And I think you have to be registered with CSS as well. So they'll have to like, you'll have to fill up some forms. Oh, I really? Oh, I think so. That's what, um, what they're saying anyway. Oh boy. <laughs> Whether, <laughs> you might be grandfathered in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I haven't filled out forms either. No. Oh, well, it's fun. It is. Okay, okay yeah. guys. <laughs> go, Jay. Go, Jay's go. Thanks for everything. Night. Yeah. Night. 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 Night.